Hello and welcome. We have all heard that the computer revolution that has changed our lives so drastically is based on computers understanding the world in ones and zeros. You have also most likely heard this is described as binary. First, this video is going to explain what binary really means. Then we are going to see how we can use this knowledge not only to save numbers, but also text, images, and much more inside the computer. In normal life, we use a number system called decimal that has 10 digits, 0 through 9. We call this the base 10 number system since it's based on having 10 digits. Normally, computers use two digits, 0 and 1. The word binary means relating to, composed of, or involving two things. The reason why computers use the binary or base 2 number system is because computers use an electronic switch called a transistor to keep track of all data, perform logic, and also arithmetic. The fact that any switch, including a transistor, has two states, off and on, works well with binary because we can represent the off state with a zero in the on state with a one. Modern computers have billions of these transistors etched in a substance called silicon. It uses them by representing all of its data in ones and zeros by turning them on and off. Here we are representing a five by turning on the first switch, off the second, and on the third. But how did we know that? Let's break it down by counting up from zero. Here we see what we can do with just three switches. Starting with the first one, we have our zero and one states that we can represent with one switch. When we add a second switch, we can see that by having the second switch on, we give ourselves anew the ability to add in this first switch. So we end up with four values total. If we have three switches, we double it yet again. The total possibility that we can represent with these three switches is eight values. You can see see that we can count up 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, let's dive a little bit deeper by revisiting some of the math that we learned in grade school so that we can use it to become binary wizards. We're going to use a slightly larger number this time, namely 42. Remember your ones, tens, and hundreds places? Well, in base 2 number system, you have ones, just like decimal, twos, 4s, 8s, 16s, 32s, 64s, and 128s. In fact, it keeps doubling the higher you go. If we break the number 42 up in decimal, we know that we have 4 10s and 2 1s. If we take the same number and we break it into binary places, we have 132, 18, and 1, 2. Remember that you cannot have a digit that is larger than the base, so you cannot, for example, have 4 eighths to reach 32. Since binary numbers are base 2, all of your digits must be either a 0 or a 1. Let's take a little bit of a closer look now on how we decided on our places. Our places in decimal are powers of 10, starting with the 1's place, which was 10 to the power of 0. Now, anyone remember the 0 power rule? That's right. Anything to the power of 0 is a 1, so 10 to the 0 power is a 1. The next place was represented by 10 to the power of 1, which represented 10, and 10 to the power of 2, which then represented 100. This idea of raising the base to an increasing power is known as the weight of that place, and you use it to multiply the digit and achieve the value. In our example here, we have 1, 1, 1 in decimal. We have 1 in the hundredths place, which is 10 to the second. We have 1 in the tens place, which is 10 to the first. And we have 1 in the ones place, which is 10 to the zero. We know that 10 to the zero is a 1 because of the zero power rule. So our value is our digit 1 times our weight, which is 1, and that gives us a 1. In the tens place, we have a weight of 10 because we know that 10 to the power of 1 is 10. We multiply that by the digit in that place which is also a 1 and also provides us a 10. Lastly we do the same in the hundredths place. We have a weight here of 10 to the 2 which is 100. We multiply that by the actual digit in that place which is a 1 and we get a value of 100. Adding up the values from all three places we have 100 plus 10 plus 1, which is 111. Of course, we already knew this, and this seems ridiculous when we look at it this way because it's intuitive to us. We've used decimal our whole lives. 
but we can use this same idea to take numbers in different bases and convert them so that we know what the decimal value is. In binary, the process is the same except that the weights are different. Each weight in binary is determined by raising the base, which is 2, to increasing powers. So instead of 10 to the 0 power, 10 to the first power, and 10 to the second, as we had in decimal, we have 2 to the 0 power, 2 to the first power, and 2 to the second power in binary. If we want to know what the decimal value is of the binary number 111, we can multiply those digits by the weights in each place. So we still have a 1's place, which is 2 to the 0 power, which we know is a 1. So our 1 times 1 is still a 1. We have a 1 in the 2's place, and we call it the 2's place because 2 to the first power is a 2. And then lastly, we have a 4's place because 2 to the second power is 4. So multiplying that by the value of that digit is a 4. So we add them up, 4 plus 2 plus 1 is 7. So our result is that the number 111 in base 2 or binary is equivalent to the number 7 in decimal. Congratulations, you now know how to determine the decimal equivalent of a binary number. If you want to know how to determine the binary equivalent of a decimal number, the quick version is that you divide, starting with the largest binary weight that can fit into the number. You can find a more detailed explanation of that here. Speaking of other bases, it's important to note that computer scientists especially love to use hexadecimal because it represents large binary numbers much more succinctly. This is because powers of base 16 allow four binary bits to be represented by one hexadecimal character, meaning a long binary number like this one can be represented by a much shorter hexadecimal version like this. I go into this much more deeply and my supplement videos here on different number bases, arithmetic in different number bases, and conversion between different number bases. Now that we are ninja masters of binary, how can we apply our cunning to saving and working with information that is not a number, say, like this infamous text? Let's look at some binary digits. This example has 8 bits. By the way, 8 bits is commonly known as a byte. What does this grouping of 8 bits represent? Well, it could be a number. If we use the skills we gained in converting binary to decimal, we can see that the weights 1, 32, and 64 all have a 1. Well, if I add them up, 64 plus 32 is 96, and a 1 is 97. So, we get the value 97. These binary digits could mean the number 97, but do they in this example? Well, of course, possibly they could. It depends, but not this time. This time, they represent the lowercase letter a. A single letter in computer science is commonly called a character. So we can say that this binary represents the character a, specifically the lowercase character a. This is accomplished by using encoding, which is really no different from when you were a kid and creating and sending secret messages to your friends. We are just simply going to represent letters with predetermined binary numbers, and as long as you have the right key, you can decode our message. Our A is encoded in this wonderfully easy to read chart that represents a standard known as ASCII. The chart we are looking at here shows all the characters that can be encoded with the first seven bits. Original ASCII only used seven bits to save characters to save a little bit of space. Later, 8-bit ASCII was introduced, or extended ASCII, and this doubled the amount of characters you could represent to 256. You can see here in our 7-bit version of ASCII that we can represent uppercase and lowercase letters, numbers, special characters, and control characters. More recently, newer encoding schemes such as UTF have been used, which allow many more possibilities because they increase the number of bits that can be used to represent a single character. UTF allows us to include Arabic and Chinese scripts and also emojis. Looking at the ASCII chart here, if we want to find the letter A, we can look across the top at the most significant or 
the highest order, three bits. So remember that we gave the full 8-bit number, but this is only a 7-bit ASCII chart, so you can ignore the leading zero in our number. What you're looking for here across the top is the 100 to denote that you found the right column. Then you look down the rows for the four least significant bit combination. Drawing at the intersection of the row and the column, you can see that our letter A resides at 100 Zero, 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 0001. We now know how to do text, but what about more complicated data like photographs? Well, we can represent the color of a discrete part of your screen known as a pixel or picture element with bits representing the color of that pixel. If we look at a purely black and white example like the one we have here, we could represent each pixel with one bit. Zero representing black because the pixel isn't on, and one representing white because the pixel is on. Since our example here is very small, only 22 pixels wide by 23 pixels tall, if we multiply that out, we need only a total of 506 bits to represent this entire image. What about a more realistic example? Well, images today are much larger. This particular image is 6,000 pixels across by 4,000 pixels high. Multiplying that out gives us 24 million pixels. We also refer to this as a 24 megapixel image. Just like before, each pixel in the image is represented with a certain number of bits for the color. However, we want more than just black and white. In this case, we have 16 million color possibilities per pixel. This is achieved by using 24 bits. We take that total of 24 bits and we break it into three 8-bit segments, one for each of the primary colors that are being used. While all of these millions of colors and pixels allow our image to look beautiful, it comes at a cost. Without any compression, which is a method of making the data smaller, this image would take up 71 megabytes of storage space. Now imagine that this is just one image in a high resolution video at 30 frames per second. Needless to say, there are very clever methods to make these image sizes smaller while doing our best not to destroy their beauty. So now that we know what bits are and how we use them to represent numbers, characters, images, and more, how do we know which bits represent which things? The answer is data types and metadata. Programmers use data types to decide whether a particular bit of information is a boolean, a number, a character, or a string. And by the way, a string is simply more than one character brought together. It also could be a more complex data type, like an object. The programming language uses the data types to keep track of each piece of data in memory and know how it should be used. Similarly, files stored on your computer can use metadata to keep track of what type of information they store. Metadata is simply information about the data. A text document, for example, includes metadata that declares which encoding scheme is used. Maybe it's ASCII, or maybe it's UTF-8. Have you ever tried to open a file that was not a text-based file in an editor? I have an example here of what happens when I try to open an image in my text editor. Notice what I see here. It's a bunch of gibberish in the editor. This is because the editor is attempting to decode the bits that that are inside the file with the wrong key. Instead of looking at those bits as representing the colors of each individual pixel, it's trying to decode them against either the ASCII or UTF encoding scheme for text. Obviously doing so is going to result in seemingly random gibberish. Metadata is also used to define other information about the data. For images, for example, metadata might be used to save the location or GPS coordinates in which I took the photograph. It may also contain the horizontal and vertical number of pixels in the image to define the resolution, as well as the amount of bits that are used to represent each color or the color depth. Metadata can also include information like who owns the file and when it was last edited. We explored a lot in this video, but it is only the beginning. I have additional videos that dive deeper into number systems. I particularly recommend long division and hexadecimal. It'll make you the center of attention at the next party. And videos that dive deeper into how data Data is represented and importantly compressed using lossless and lossy compression techniques. If you'd like to learn how to program, please check out my video series here. It's designed to be used on the internet.
internet and incorporates theory along with practice. Thank you for watching today and please consider subscribing if this kind of content is something that makes you happy. As always, I hope you are having a wonderful day and I look forward to seeing you again.